The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Closing the Critical Skills Gap for Modern and Effective Security Operations Center Survey Results, sponsored by Awake, Anomaly, Cisco, ExtraHop, LogRhythm, Reversing Labs, Samplify, Swimlane, and ThreatConnect. My name is Jessica Gallus of SANS, and today's featured speakers are Barbara Filkins, SANS Analyst Program Research Director, and John Pescatore, Director of Emerging Security Trends, who will be moderating today's webcast. If during the web webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to John. Okay, thanks Jessica and welcome everyone. I'm John Pescatori. Welcome to the webcast on this survey Barbara and I did. Uh, it's a popular topic. You can tell by the long list of sponsors, but also by the very long title. Um, took us a lot of words to get across uh, what we were trying to do in this survey. So let me give you an idea of what we want to do. I usually try to start by breaking the ice and looking back in history on something interesting that occurred on this date in history. And not a heck of a lot of interesting happens in the dog days of summer. Remember in the old days when this was vacation time? The only things I could find was about now, a year or so ago, Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, had his, had his account hacked. And you would have hoped that it would have caused him to focus on increasing the security of Twitter, but no, they had very important individual accounts hacked here recently. And the skew old on you back in 1981, apparently that's when Lady Di and Princess Charles got married back when that was an exciting event in the summer. So not a heck of a lot of exciting things, but this is also that period of time where quite often we're integrating the new hires into our organization and trying to get them as productive as fast as possible. And that's sort of what we focused this survey on. So to give you an idea of what we're gonna go through, um, Barb and I will uh, sort of split things up and, and talk to each about different sections. But as we go along, there'll be an opportunity to answer your questions as we, as we go along. We'll save plenty of time at the end as well. But if you have a question while I'm speaking or Barbara's speaking, enter them into that little window on the toolbar on the right-hand side, and I'll be watching and uh, we can try to get to as many as possible real time. If you are watching a recorded version of this webinar, at the end, I'll give you an email address you can send your questions to and we'll get you the uh, right answer from the right person. But I mentioned, uh, and uh, Jessica went through the list of sponsors here. We're also gonna give some of the sponsors an opportunity to sort of weigh in on uh, what they've seen from their customers on, on the uh, skills gaps and hiring needs and, and hiring methods and the like. And you see the information up same, same bat time, same bat channel here uh, tomorrow, if you're interested in hearing from uh, um, some additional experts in the field. So with that, let's get started. So I joined SANS back in 2013 after oh, almost 14 years as the lead security analyst at Gardner and spent my whole career in security and seen a lot of surveys, done a lot of surveys and to skew old again, I'm quoting Albert Einstein here uh, that I think is a good quote that, you know, the questions are the important part that uh, any survey can get any results it wants by focusing on the questions. What we were trying to do here is not boil the ocean not ask a thousand questions about hiring and come back with the numbers you're seeing constantly that millions of jobs are available in security, but to really ask hiring managers, um, what were their critical gaps? What were the most effective ways they found in, in filling those critical gaps? And what were some of the uh, success stories and, and key things they could pass on to uh, the audience here? Uh, the whole goal at SANS is always to have these webinars deliver data that you can use to take action to do better at your job and, and help your company do better at security. We wanna avoid the kind of USA Today type surveys that end up in data that's not telling you anything you really need to know. And whoops, we, we're having a slow internet day. So that's uh, the example of the types of things we're trying to avoid. So you'll, you'll get the greatest on that. So again, the goal is to highlight the actionable parts of the survey. You'll all be getting URLs for the full details out of the survey and can read the uh, full results as you, as you uh, get time. So the goal there is to figure out ways to help 
enterprises increase both the effectiveness and the efficiency of security operations. So on the right-hand slide, you see these six patterns. This comes from another paper that I did a number of years ago at SANS that was looking at how um, security operations centers can move up the, you know, sort of like a SOC maturity model concept, but move up to these patterns, the higher level patterns, which are both more efficient and more effective. You know, typically in any maturity model, at the bottom, you're chaotic, at the top, you're adaptive, in between, you're making steps between the two. And usually what happens is you get more effective the more mature you get at doing anything. You're, you're better at it. You're not necessarily more efficient because you're investing in formalizing things and doing them in repeatable ways. And once you start reaching, in this case, uh, the pretty good sock at, at pattern five up there, uh, you're starting to do things in a repeatable way. You're starting to use force multipliers for tools and starting to be able to move up from everybody's working as hard as they can, like Luthi and Ethel, Ethel on the chocolate factory production line there, to uh, where uh, most of the arrows are coming pretty close to the target. Uh, starting to make it where we're going to home in on the bullseye and the important part of enabling business while keep letting the good guys in while keeping the bad guys out. And nobody or very few people ever reach the unicorns powered by rainbows uh, type thing at the at the top level of any of these maturity levels. But the idea there is to not only be effective and efficient at what you're doing now, but to be able to be more, do it more continuously and to be able to adapt more quickly. As we all know, one of the reasons cybersecurity is a fun area to work in is everything changes constantly. It's not just the technology changes, the way the business wants to use the technology changes. The bad guys think of new vulnerabilities and new attacks. And by the time we've got a handle on that, the technology changes and the business changes again. So uh, the, the key is adaptability and the ability to do things in repeatable manners, but also be updating everything in repeatable manners. And that, that's got to carry into a number of areas, but we got to keep the main goal in mind. The main goal is we have to be using the company's resources to be making a difference to the company's bottom line. And sort of the way I translate that is into the standard um, uh, attack model kind of kill chain scenario that we basically want to move things to the left. We want to reduce the amount of incident response we're doing and clean up after damage and move things to more early action and as much as possible damage prevention. You know, the, these recent ransomware attacks, uh, I, don't, I do a lot of bicycling, Garmin just got hacked and uh, they looks like they may have had to pay off a ransom event. So you can see the costs they're gonna occur because of the late action. Whereas if they'd have done some early things to realize they were vulnerable to certain attacks or they didn't have backups or whatever the case was, to be able to uh, react very quickly right when the threat was delivered and perhaps avoid all that big loss right there, you're able to show the company that its investments in the security people, the security processes and technology to implement those controls is paying off to the company's bottom line. Now, uh, any survey ever done, we, didn't, we actually didn't include these questions in this survey, but any survey ever done where you ask what are the major obstacles to anything, not just cybersecurity, if yes, business managers this or CIOs this or the head of procurement this, the obstacle is always the company doesn't give me enough resources and the company doesn't understand my problem enough. So it's key in cybersecurity like everywhere else to find these force multipliers where we can say, yeah, we know we're not gonna get the number of people we need or the full budget we need or food. where do we find ways to, with the staff we do have, uh, if nothing else, prioritize what everybody looks at first. So the most likely threats that are most likely to cause damage show up first and that we're using tools to help people react more quickly and eliminate some of the redundant things and the parts people hate or put in tools in place so that the real skilled unicorn type analysts don't have to do the mundane things yet they can pass off prioritize, prioritize work cues to the, uh, the lower level staff and so on. So uh, I always like uh, pointing to um, stuff from the sand sock research side of things, Chris Crowley, especially in the, the holy triad of people process and technology is all about efficiency and effectiveness in all three of those areas. We're gonna focus a lot on the sort of people side here and the technology side a bit, um, but obviously it really does start with processes, being able to put in place documented repeatable processes that can survive when headcounts change or when there are gaps in headcounts and, and so on. So where we well, that's what we focused on. Um, there's been a lot of things out there that have sort of bugged me over the years. As long as far as go as 15 years ago when I was at Gardner, when we first started hearing this, there's millions of unfilled positions in cybersecurity, and the, the numbers just don't add up. If you if you 
added to everybody's budget, if you doubled the security staff to everybody's budget, loads of companies would start losing money. So this issue, as we at Gardner, and, and certainly for the past uh, eight years at SANS, as we talked to SOC managers and CISOs, isn't really about just filling headcount. It's really that there's gaps or there's skill, there's gaps in skills or in capabilities that I need to fill. And there's been this myth that if I train my people, they'll just leave and get a higher paying job because there's a million unpaid jobs out there. So we wanted to look into turnover and attrition as well. And you know, Barbara go through some interesting data there. And then from a hiring perspective, sort of knew the answer to this one and it was validated in what came back, but what's the best source for productive new hires? Um, another area that's come up in several surveys, even when we didn't ask the questions directly, but when we did qualitative interviews with uh, the hiring managers was, what are some of the things you wish a new hire could do, an entry level hire could do on day one that typically you see they're not able to do? Um, and then an interesting thing happened here that Barb will go through. Just coincidentally, the survey started out pretty much right when the pandemic was declared. So most of the respondents um, had lots of uncertainty and Barb, Barb will go through that. So this, I call it the new reality. We're now, what are we, four months into this first phase of the new reality. It will change things about hiring. It will change things about how teams have to work together. It will change things about some of the skills they need in order to collaborate and influence and, and drive change. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll touch on that towards the end. So let's uh, let's get going. So let me turn things over to Barb and she'll go through the demo demographics and some of the key um, key uh, things we around the data we gather. Okay. Well, thanks, John. Um, this is our typical demographic snapshot that we started to put in our survey papers because everybody always wants to know about the demographics, but they don't want to know about the demographics. But somehow when you do a survey, you have to say who your respondent audience was. And in a lot of ways, this is similar to what we normally get with SANS with some twists. Um, we did see our top four being technology, banking and finance, government and cybersecurity. What's interesting is technology and cybersecurity are really more of, I would say, technology providers, service providers, that kind of category. Banking and finance is a major vertical, and of course, government. Um, we also had an orientation more towards the small end, which might also be influenced by the fact that we were looking at the technology and cybersecurity. Uh, maybe I'm wrong on this, but a lot of security technology firms tend to be lightweight. They have smaller, um, employee populations, and maybe in the pandemic world, they're a little bit more agile than either government or banking. Um, we also had, uh, normally we do have security administrators and analysts, non-management roles as our majority, and that was the case here. But when you take a look at the security manager and director, the security architect, which is kind of one of those hybrid management technical roles and IT manager or director, we really had more of an influence, I think, in this survey on the management viewpoint than we normally do. And the other thing also in terms of operations and headquarters, we were very much US centric, but we also got pretty good response from um, the international scene as well. Next slide. Okay. <laughs> so Really quickly, what are the demographic takeaways? Well, the first thing, um, and that picture down in the corner was the number who accessed a week, and then the number who said, you know, yeah, I'm qualified, we'll go on. Um, the survey ran from the beginning of March through the end of May. The WHO declared the pandemic on the 11th of March. So really, the timing for the survey was totally in the path of the pandemic, and it put the industries that we look that are the leading industries in the shadow of the unknown. Uh, government probably may have suffered the worst, um, but it influenced banking and finance, education and cybersecurity as well. And then the geographic demo distribution, as I said, was more uniform than normal. Normally we're very US centric and indeed we were US centric for this survey, but we had more of a response from the overseas and the international population than we normally do. So next slide, that one came up quick. <laughs> so what does this mean for hiring plans? Well, what was very interesting is that uncertainty of the unknown as opposed to the certainty of the known. 
the pandemic required or basically created two scenarios. The first one was there was a very rapid transition to an almost 100% work from home environment. We had another uh, survey around this time, a questionnaire in terms of remote workers and the transition, the shift was quite amazing, um, including the security team. So that rapid transition was, I think, very unique, but it was overshadowed by an economic uncertainty, which still exists today, though things have kind of stabilized to a certain extent. And what was really interesting here was that the vertical with the highest uncertainty in hiring staff was government, with 52% of those respondents expressing concern over the fact that they were not sure of where they would be going forward. Um, and then we had, you know, basically 34 versus 25 percent that said they were going to add it. John, do you want to add anything on this uncertainty? Yeah, a couple things uh, on that government thing. Certainly in the U.S., I'm, I'm can't say I'm as positive about this outside the U.S., but in the U.S., um, government had the most trouble moving the work from home because in in the U.S. federal government, certainly there'd been resistance to supporting work from home. And we've certainly seen that in uh, in many states as well. So the uncertainty, a lot of that has to do with, can they even be functional without working from home? And if they have to go back to offices early in the midst of the pandemic, are they really gonna hire people and so on? The other thing we saw, th this really has nothing to do with the headcount thing, but it, it's something important for everybody to keep in mind. Um, IT had to scramble to, to deal with performance of everything in work from home. We had a very early work from home seminar that or a webinar that myself and Randy Marchani uh, spoke at as the CISO of um, Virginia Tech. And you know we think about the security aspect and the security teams distributed and how do we do our job? Well, the IT team had to scramble just to make sure people could connect. They didn't have the capacity in VPNs. They didn't have the uh, all the applications that were able to handle it and so on. One side effect of that seems to be um, a dramatic drop in their performance in patching, especially on server side things where the IT team is distributed as well. They're not necessarily all sitting in the building where the data center is and now they have things out in the cloud and they're not even near the physical data center. So, you know, things even like exchange patches that typically you might see 70% patched within a month of the exchange patches. Three months later, these critical patches from March 80% were unpatched. So there's a, this whole work from home thing here is, is a security impact both to the productive productivity of the security team, but also a very negative, it's sort of like forced the IT operations side to focus up oh, performance is job one for a while. Okay, we got to get back to performance and reliability and security is job one again. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's something that's starting to rear its ugly head. Yeah, I think one kind of amusing sideline, though, is with the work from home, a lot of people have become their own security experts. So I get amused by people that say, you know, your Internet connection isn't working as well. And I'm thinking to myself, my Internet connection is fine. I think it's downstream in terms of the server, but that's OK. We'll deal with it. I think you're I'm handing it over to you next, John, on the external services. Yeah, so uh, one of the questions we asked was about the plan. This is a standard one we've asked in lots of these. What's your current use of external service providers, you know, outsourcing or managed service providers, and and what are your plans? So if you if you kind of do the math, if you look at the uh, one on the left hand side there bar chart, um, about 18.5 percent were unknown, didn't know what their use of it was. So if you take them out and you add up uh, the rest of the numbers then about 65% or almost two thirds of them were using some form, some amount of external service providers and about 26% of them plan to increase that. Uh, and that's a little higher than you typically see quite often. I mean, the, the two thirds using some form is pretty typical, but 26% saying increase and only I think it was 7% saying they plan on uh, decreasing when you had the, the bottom two. Um, quite often what you see is we're making investments, whether it's in SIM or in SOAR tools or other things where we hope we'll be able to convince management that we need to build up the uh, SOC staff and, and have less reliance on external third parties. But again, the uncertainty here is, well, I may not be able to hire 
So I better fight for uh, external service budget to make sure I can still uh, cover things. When we ask what particular roles, you see that on the right-hand side. Now there's a standard thing that generally outsourcing of threat-facing skills or attack, uh, attack techniques and threat facing skills, external threat facing skills is usually the, always at the top outsource. For one, that's where the deep expertise is. The other is that it's less business specific. If I'm in pharmaceuticals, the somebody telling me how to run my firewalls or monitoring my firewalls or pen testing me um, that I might do for only four times a year or six times a year, outsourcing is okay. You look down at the bottom with the small plane, you know, architects and and uh, compliance and, and data protection, things that are very closely tied to the way we do business are, are less likely to, to be outsourced. Um, so to sort of s s s uh, summarize what we saw on the outsourcing side of things, those deep narrow skills, you know, we all want to hire T-shaped analysts is the term. Although I found another one, pie shape, where if you're good at two things, you're a pie shaped analyst. But the T-shaped analyst that's deep in one area but has broad skills as well, that's what we all want to hire. Uh, those deep narrow skills like pen testing or digital forensics or other specialties or what have increased the, the amount of um, uh, outsourcing interest and and those internal facing skills like architectures or data protection and like the least and security operations somewhat in between what we saw was that distribution did not change that it wasn't all of a sudden well we're gonna we're gonna uh, uh, rely more on internal pen testers and the, and the like uh, but the overall numbers in each category kind of went up so there is this issue of um if I'm afraid I'm not going to be a hire anybody, I better think more about outsourcing. So let me see. Uh, we got a question here. Please define job would go under threat intelligence compared to threat research and hunting. There is some overlap there, but the intent was threat intelligence are the types of services and data collection could be open source, could be collating um, vendor information, or it could be proprietary looking into dark web and, and honey pots and, and other ways of gathering sort of unique threat information. That's typically a, a threat intelligence server. And for example, a couple of sponsors of this are in the threat intelligence business. Threat research and hunting is more the internal side that it would be people skills who are gonna be um, having the threat, threat information in mind, going across the system, looking into endpoints, uh, pulling in information saying, wait a minute, I think we have a compromise already that hasn't been detected, the typical hunting type skills. So the differentiation is threat intelligence or threat research and hunting is, is more of that person job with some skills. Threat intelligence is more of a data as a service feed almost. So let's say, I think we go back to you next here, Barbie. Yeah. I think you're right. So one of the things that was very interesting, we looked at attrition and attrition in the sense um, people leaving. And we found that hiring is offsetting attrition, the government being the exception, which might also be a function of the pandemic. Um, but what was also interesting, this was actually from a survey that John and I did earlier this year, is that I maintain that you also need to look at what happens because people that are hired, it just goes back to the fact, you know, they get promoted, they get better at their jobs, they move up the food chain, not necessarily management, but, you know, into a position of more responsibility or um, going back to that T-shape analysis, they have broad skills at the top, but they have a very deep understanding of a specific um, capability that they're being leveraged. And so the gains are negative, but not necessarily in a bad way, because it means that the hiring needs to keep up at the bottom with the people that are getting more capabilities and are being promoted up through the company. Um, that's not normally a, a factor that is considered um, when you start looking at the hiring and firing uh, stats, but it's something that I think speaks to a stability in the industry. Um, the other thing is when we looked at it by size, uh, small companies are seeing the highest turnover. That may also have to do with the fact that we have tech and cybersecurity and the talent pools there are fairly mobile. Um, but the overall turnover was below industry average. And before I go on to that visual, John, do you want to say anything to this? Yeah, I think that's an important thing for everybody to keep in mind. And we'll we'll go down as Barb goes through her takeaways and I have some later on, some additional thoughts there. But 
I, I started out my career in cybersecurity right out of college, going to work for the government at NSA and then the Secret Service after that. And as a government employee, we used to always complain, hey, private industry makes a lot more money than we do. Uh, and the bosses would always say, yeah, but the attrition, the turnover in the government's much lower, so you must love it here. And that's there's, there's some truth there that um, people don't just leave jobs for, for money. Um, but if the turnover is low, there's reasons and there's opportunities to get higher salaries out there, which we know there are. There's reasons why. And we wanted to uncover some of those reasons why is turnover low. And certainly in the government, you can see in this case, in cybersecurity, turnover is quite higher because the government salaries are not just lower than, than average, they're much lower in cybersecurity. So there's a, there is a lot of government brain drain, drain as people move from government to private industry. But when, when attrition rates are not high, but people are claiming there's lots of unfilled jobs and everybody will make money, then you know there's a mismatch between what everybody's saying and what the reality is. And we'll, we'll touch on that as we go along. Okay, so just taking a look at this graphically on the next slide. Oh, oops. What we have on the top is the those red arrows, you know, average annual turnover, um, low is 10%, high is 15%, technology is towards the higher end, about 13.5%. And so when we looked at some of the numbers that we had gotten, um, we find that the attrition at the cybersecurity is for the most part below that 10%. So it's not in the common rate. So it's it's not as much of a, I don't know if you want to call it a driver or a problem, um, as it might be seen. So turnover in that sense is not as high. Um, the cybersecurity firm by industry and small firms were in those higher ends, and of course government trumped it at the 14%. But again, in most segments, it's well below average. So going on to the takeaways. Actually, we take this as good news. Um, back to that comment that John made about, you know, if we train them, they'll leave. Well, longevity of staff is normally a leading indicator of a strong cybersecurity program, or it should be. And teamwork trumps technology when it comes to working across the business to avoid vulnerabilities and quickly react to threats and develop new techniques and processes and implementing new technology, because very often, the company will buy the technology and then not give the staff enough time to really explore all the power that that technology has provides. Um, the thing here is that this doesn't necessarily obviate the need for using outside um, services like pen testing. It kind of turns it around a little bit. So for an enterprise, you want tech, you want your teamwork to be people that really understand the enterprise and the technology that the enterprise is using and be current and capable with that. The flip side of it is when you come to something like pen testing or um, let's say instant response in a very narrow world, you look for those firms that have developed their teams with an emphasis on the excellence in pen testing and knowing how to pen test. And those people can stay fresh in that skill set as opposed to bringing them into the company and then they kind of get dulled down because you don't do pen testing all the time. The other thing is that I think our results also say that there should be a goal of minimizing security team turnover in whatever way is best, um, you can best handle it. And constantly increasing salaries isn't usually the most effective approach. And I don't want to bash government, but the thought was going through my head when John was talking about government, Sometimes it's not just the salary, it's the quality of life. So if you're working in a highly regulated environment with little ability to be um, creative, I'll use it for the want of a better word, in, in using your talents in the security world, there's plenty of places where you can go out and have your talents effectively utilized. And so that might be another reason why people might be leaving a more regulated or structured environment. Um, and the thoughts would be is, you know, try providing that well-defined career path to avoid alert burnout, be able to demonstrate advancement, again, not just in money and management, but also allowing these talented people to be more creative, if you will. Uh, provide sufficient funding for training and skills enhancement 
it's going to be a perk that might keep them with your enterprise as opposed to have them train and then leave. And many years ago, I got beat up for using the word play. But, you know, the opportunities to play with and develop new security tools and techniques, and it's not just developing new tools, but being able to use the tools you have in new ways. So I think a very, as much as possible, a creative environment um, around your security and possibly your IT teams can keep your enterprise, keep the skill and the staff, keep the skilled staff in your tech, in your enterprise, in your enterprise. But then the question of hiring. Next slide. Okay. Um, I'm gonna let you have your two cents worth in a minute, John. <laughs> but sure. I just wanted to say it's, it's what we found here, it really is who you know that matters. Um, by far the leading and most successful sources for potential new hires came from within the organizations. And this is another reason why you want to try to keep your team in place if possible. Existing employees in the IT organization and referrals for new staff. So if your employee and consultant base is happy with you as an organization, you're going to get better referral and probably better potential hires and actual hires than otherwise. And the trends appear universal here. They're connected to neither industry nor organizational size. So the bottom takeaway is satisfied good employees are the leading source for more employees. Now, there is one little thing we wanted to make a comment on, and I think John will add to it. Um, existing employees in our IT organization, it's kind of like you're, you're stealing from Peter to pay Paul in some ways. Um, we're not trying to say that the IT staff should be moved to security but it's something to be aware of. And I'll let you make a comment on that, John, because I know that you were very interested in that one. Yeah, this is one of the, you know, if we put our security blinders on, there's lots of things we could do to make security better that may make the overall company worse. Not gonna make a friend of the CIO who may be the CISO's boss if we're always stealing from IT operations to feed security operations. But if that's part of a recognized strategy that says it's probably easier to hire new Cisco certified network technicians um, into IT than it is to be hired, uh, higher end skilled cybersecurity analysts that can go to work and do cybersecurity from day one. So if it's part of a, a planned thing, we know this is gonna be the best source for security people, so let's work on the pipeline for junior IT people coming into IT and desktop and user operations and the like is a, a successful strategy out there. Second thing is this idea it's, it's pretty common sense that the longer a team stays together, the more productive the team will be. You know, the, the, that maturity model I put up, you know, ideally we have processes and playbooks and automation and all kinds of things that the machine keeps humming even as the people change. Well, we all know that's, that's not true. That's, very few of us are gonna be at the rainbow unicorn level where that type of stuff works if, if anybody's ever really there. So again, longevity of a team. I, I could tell this at Gardner from, year to year, the, the, I'd be dealing with the same companies on the phone, they'd spend about the same amount on security, yet the ones that had the same people talking to me each year were never in the news for breaches. The other ones were, oh yeah, we're dealing with another breach, what do you think about this? Um, so, second thing is, um, oh, let me get to a question here, and, and Barb, I'll get your opinion on this too. Question says, um, whoops, a new one came in and pushed the old one there. Question says, is turnover, is this truly focused on SOC, basically? Because um, we have some roles in there like auditor that really don't fall under the purview of SOC. So in the title, we certainly did uh, uh, put SOC in there. We tend to focus most of our attention in it. But when we were asking about the skills and the gaps, we did include way more than uh, uh, what, what might fit into the standard definition of a SOC. Certainly auditors are rare, rarely in the SOC. But in general, most of the, the gaps and the, the skills and the areas fell out of the roles that are in the security operations side. You know, for example, a security architect is often not part of the SOC either. But so most of these numbers can, were not broken. I don't think we broke them down by roles, did we, Barb? Uh, we, we broke them down by respondent roles. I don't think we broke it down by roles. I'm taking a quick look through the survey. I don't think we talked about the roles. Um, we didn't flip it the other way and, and ask 
a role in that sense. Um, but the thing I would say, well, that's hiring authority. Um, but I would say that our results were weighted mostly from the analysts, the admins, and then, as I said, that distribution of of management. So it was a perspective. So I think that I would almost say that this this perspective of um, the turnover aspect is SOC. We can say it's it's strongly SOC because of the skill space, but I think it also may be more representative of what we're getting in the industry from a security community um, because the respondents to the survey, if I remember the number of, let's say, auditors and clients people were fairly low. Okay, another question came in, said our findings are similar or echo the recommendations of the Aspen Cybersecurity Group, which I actually, I haven't seen the report, I have to look into it. Um, do you know if any of the respondents align with the, that? We, I don't know the answer to that. That's something we'll look into and get you. Another question was, where can you find that paper I mentioned with the SOC patterns one through six? It's a couple years old now. It's in the SANS library reading room. If you do a Google on probably my name and um, SOC maturity model, it'll it'll come up and you'll be able to download it from the SANS uh, library. One last thing, somebody said we answered the question about government is the government attrition due to um, the salary discrepancies between government and private industries. Do you want to echo what Barb said? That's, I think, a big part of it. But also in the government, we tend to see the cybersecurity groups are, have uh, even less authority. So they often have responsibility and blame, but often even less authority than cybersecurity groups in private industry. And a lot more frustration on that side of things. There's also that Barb mentioned, and um, I'm going to emphasize this in a bit, the play aspect or creativity aspect and getting the work with tools and create things and do more than just sort of stare at alerts all day. Quite often in the government, it's contractors, uh, insourcers or outsourcers or just you know defense contractors and the like that get to do the cool part. And uh, the government cybersecurity side are mostly doing the program management and the the not so creative or, or fun side. I think that is also that's one of the that's why I left the government all those years ago, and I think we hear a lot about that uh, still today. Okay, let's move on before we start running out of time here. So um, another question we asked, and I've also asked this in a number of different ways on SOC surveys and a, a different survey. Alan Paller, founder of SANS, and I did uh, late let or early a couple years ago, um, we asked hiring managers, what tools do you wish new hires knew how to use on day one? So not what topics could they talk about, but what actual products and tools could they use? And you see um, on them listed in, in order of frequency there, uh, the top 12. And you see there's a lot of open source tools, you know, Wireshark being at the top. There's commercial SIM products. Splunk happened to be the most commonly mentioned um, product, uh, commercial product. And then you see lots of different areas. And when I did the qualitative interviews on the SOC surveys, what came back several times, uh, a couple, couple common themes came back was, you know, first off, typically, we have to have somebody sit with a new SOC analyst side saddle for a couple of days and show them we use this tool, that tool, and this tool is integrated to that tool. And we're not really explaining to them what a threat is. They under, they know cybersecurity, but these actual tools we're using, they did not use in college or they did not use at their last job or whatever. Um, the second thing is that um, the um, so that, that the hidden productivity meant a new hire is not only less productive than an experienced hire, I'm pulling experienced hires to sort of sit, si sit side saddle with, um, with the, the new ones coming on. Um, another interesting one was one of the, it didn't make the top 12, but this came across from a couple, said we'd also wish they were fluent in the use of grown up collaboration tools by which they meant Outlook. <laughs> Out, you know, we wish we wish they used email and they weren't constantly thinking you collaborated through. They used Outlook and Teams and they weren't frequently, you know. No, we don't use Twitter for that. No, we don't use WhatsApp for that. That's not how we do things. So I thought that was a funny comment. But what the common thread um, came across was tools. And if you were to listen to a lot of the very large vendors out there who were saying, "Oh, everybody uses too many security products." Well, nobody wants to use dozens and dozens of security products out there and tools, but nobody says, yeah, there's one vendor that tells me every tool I want. As you can see, 
by the mix of open source and commercial. So part of this gets to, um, you know, my father was a mechanic and he wasn't just going to Sears and buying a 72 piece toolkit to do his job. He was buying the best tools for the particular parts of the job he needed because he was really good at his job and he enjoyed being really good at his job and he was really proud of being good at his job and good tools were part of him being good at his job and I think that's true uh, across security as well. Another thing that came across from the hiring managers was the ones that had um, the most use of particularly the open source tools they tended to have, this is a small sample size, you know, like a dozen respondents, tended to have the lowest rates of attrition. Like the comment was, yeah, we have, a, I have 10 people on our team. I've only had to replace one of them over the years. And that's because she got a, a better job when her husband got another job somewhere else. You know, they, they moved kind of thing. And and they said, yeah, we by, by them building with these tools and playing with these tools and maintaining those tools, they get to be developers, not just responders, not just they're, they're, they're part of preventing bad things from happening or creative, creative ways to detect things quicker rather than just typing a lot all day long. Um, so that creative and playing that Barb brought out, I think is really key to, to to longevity, to low attrition, which is just so key to productivity overall. Um, you know, again, if you don't have to, if you need to hire one additional person um, to handle the increased load and you had two people leave, now you have to hire three. And uh, that's that's 10 times harder than, than just hiring one. So anyway, the uh, sort of mix of tools and let people play and having budgets or time where people can uh, do that type of thing. And as Barb mentioned, the, uh, the ability to move between different groups and play different roles and get exposed is sort of part of that both creativity and play aspect. And actually, John, I have a comment on that one. Um, just your bullet on tool fluency. Uh, going back to your dad as a mechanic, um, it's knowing what tools fit kind of fundamentally what tools fit and where they are best applied. Um, and a lot of times fancy front ends are not necessarily the best thing to deal with that. You know, look at the fact that Python's on the list and PowerShell, you know, they're both scripting languages, so. Yeah, and if you look at uh, like a, a lot of hype around AI and uh, cybersecurity, you'll find that playing around with Python is a good way to understand how that works and what the strengths of it are and are not. So yeah, it's key. Okay, before we, uh, we're starting to get close to our end time here, let me, I just buried my question window. Let me see if we have any questions come in here. Um, in, in your T-shape analyst model, are you referring to just one tool like this list or is that more of a skill domain that you're going deep in? Typically it's more of a skill domain. Um, so a, um, yeah, everybody uses different terms, but you know, a SOC analyst on the, the uh, cyber defense side is going to be fluent in firewalls, intrusion detection, um, probably even vulnerability scanning tools and the like, whereas somebody that's more focused on data protection will be in different tools or on pen testing and different tools or on uh, uh, forensics and incident response on different tools. So it's more of a T-shaped skills than a, a single, I'm the Splunk expert of the world or I'm the Nessus exp expert of the world. Um, what about machine learning skills? Uh, question that came in. So this is a subject of a totally different set of things we're doing. I think I just did a, a vendor webinar where we touched on this and um, Dave Holtzel of uh, SANS and I have done some things together around this. Um, I, it's a, too long a topic to get into here. I will say that you know, machine learning, it's important to understand what it can and cannot do uh, to, to differentiate in the hype that vendors put on what they're doing with machine learning. And it's also important in some of these tools, you can build your own little engines to do some very useful things to take uh, your own data lakes and drill down and do a lot, a lot of stuff. So that's, that's a subject for a totally different webinar in the future. All right, with that, let's, let's get move on here a bit. So again, Skewing old, another one of my high school classmates here, Thomas Edison. Um, we like to focus on SANS, what you do, not, not what we talk about, what, what security people do and how it shows benefit to the business. And Edison was certainly a very energetic inventor who did lots of stuff, but he also realized you gotta sell the stuff, right? It's one thing to invent a phonograph, it's another thing to convince people the value of the value of the phonograph. So, you know, again, everything we do has to be measured in uh, how it helps the business or the mission in security. So if we're getting more effective and efficient, how does that connect to the business? 
And, you know, it comes back to the well-known security processes we all know have to get done to do the job right. You know, starting in the upper left of knowledge of the business and the constraints the business operates under. OTT is my own little acronym. I always keep reading to move it. That's over the transom dictates. That's uh, where management says, no, we're going to turn left here. Don't ask why. Or in the government where OMB says, no, you have to do this. And everybody has to do that. But, you know, starting from sort of knowledge of the business and what the constraints are, the business of the business are. And then we have all these different skills and roles and things around the, the circle that um, the shielding step is sort of where the, the rubber hits the road. So in this first sort of quadrant here of risk assessment and baselining and pen testing and conf hopefully everything's configured right, we know the excrement's gonna hit the ventilator. We know things are gonna go wrong. There's gonna be vulnerabilities. So there's gonna be open. What are we doing? How quickly are we reacting and moving around the rest of this circle is all about you know what we have to do. And again, I'm gonna hype on the four force multipliers again. And it is this mixture of people, process, and technology, skills in the people multiply their forces. Technology that integrate, that does a good job of fresh vulnerability data, fresh threat data, integrating that in with ways of mitigating and what, what techniques are out there and so on are really key um, to be able to do this. It's not just one or the other, you know, it's not one out of the three, it's all of the three. So to sort of summarize on some action steps and then we'll get to any remaining questions. If you do have any remaining questions, please enter them into the window there and we'll get to them. So we all hope the new reality is gonna start soon. And I certainly hope whatever part of the world you're in, you're, you're closer than uh, we are right here, right now in the, in the US, as far as uh, some semblance of business coming back to normal, but we know it'll get there. We also know there'll be differences just the way there's differences between the way we flew before September 11, 2001, and the way we flew afterwards. Um, geographies will be different if you're a multinational country, company. Um, we know there'll be ge geographic distance differences and same in verticals. So I think as you start thinking about filling those gaps, it's important to identify the real constraints, particularly this issue of distributed work and work at home. So the, the movement to cloud is uh, was happening pretty quickly before all this happened. And in this distributed environment, this movement to cloud and the movement to, com I call them commercial cloud tools, Zoom's a good example, but you know, lots of other ways of doing collaboration and storing things and sharing things is going to happen. Um, so I think from a skills perspective, we'd seen a few years ago, CISOs and hiring managers definitely highlighting cloud skills. Uh, insecurity, not necessarily I need different people. I need my security staff to be able to understand how the cloud, understand how we have to extend visibility and the like into the cloud. I, I think that's gonna bubble back up to the top because uh, we'll be in this distributed manner, manner for uh, quite some time to come. The threats, um, we, we know what the threats will do. They, they focus on the bad news. We've already seen them focusing on COVID and medical constraints. We know there's more nation state activity aimed at the healthcare center and the like because of this. Um, so I think the, the real constraints are, are a, a, I hate to use this trite term, but an opportunity to make some advances in security, things like encryption, uh, strong authentication, things that there's big barriers to having those happen. Those are skills we're gonna need because we have this opportunity when the board of directors asks, okay, how do we not have the phishing attack succeed against our internal administrators like happened to Twitter? I've seen it, I do these board of directors briefings and there's been this huge uptick of board of directors asking questions just like that. So I think there's some some new skills this is gonna cause to bubble up when we, when we do this survey the next time. And, uh, I was gonna say, John, there's another interesting thing too, two other things I wanna say as this, this move to a new reality. One is the, concept and i think uh, we've already seen that starting um i think we're going to get some data from the metric survey that kind of talks about that um that's coming up but you know a different view of situational awareness for the want of a better word i think the the community may already have it but then that links into another part that you just touched on and that is how to communicate that situational awareness in a kind of a non-physical world to people like the board of directors that are very used to effectively seeing things in black and white or brick and mortar, even though they may be, you know, depending on the company, even though they may be dealing with a multinational company where they can't just put their fingers on everything. Um, so cloud is a little bit abstracted 
in a lot of ways and being able to communicate that and make it concrete in a virtual world is another talent I think that needs to be folded in here. Sure. Um, so the gap assessment of your skills, it's easy to sort of go across the board and the, the this nice model or anything and there's dozens of categories and things you can say we well we maybe we don't have that. There's a lot of movement using the uh, uh, the MITRE ATT&CK model as an, another way of looking at uh, where you have gaps in skills. I think that's a much more realistic way of doing it from a keep the bad guys outside of things. But I think another thing you have to look at is, okay, how do we have fewer incidents and of the incidents we do have, how does each incident cause this com company less damage? Maybe I really need to hire somebody really experienced in backup systems because of uh, we're, we're we're not going to make much more of a dent in phishing. We better get much better at re restore. Or maybe I better hire somebody that's really got a lot of experience, came out of software QA or software testing, because we're not going to make much more progress on reducing the vulnerabilities in the applications we're buying unless we can do that at the front end of the, the DevOps practice, or we can get things baked into the uh, containers or baked into the pipeline type tools they're using. Um, and I think that's, you know, again, key to, if we get this opportunity to make some big changes because of the, the new reality coming along. And then what metrics, as Barb mentioned, the metric survey coming along, what things are we gonna do that increase efficiency that say, um, not only are we, do, are we able to do things faster, but we're using fewer resources per incident. You know, if, uh, if we look at the time spent, there, there's an old metric I used to use in my system engineering days. How did you know when the software was ready to be released because software always had these phony baloney ways of doing things. We used to look at the number of hours of testing time found to find the next bug. Um, so if, we, if we're if we really improving in security, it's gonna be fewer hours, fewer analyst time to close a trouble ticket, fewer analyst time to where we got from detection to uh, restore. The thing I wanna really emphasize uh, on is looking at tools for force multipliers for avoiding vulnerabilities avoiding security incidents. So early threat knowledge to say, okay, threats just started up looking for this exchange vulnerability. Let's go check, hey, wait a minute, that, that patch came out four months ago. Let's go patch it real quick. Or more complicated scenarios where um, avoiding does mean, okay, we have to put, we have to quickly go segment off these Siemens devices or these Philips devices or Schneider devices because we do have those vulnerabilities and they ain't gonna change soon. And let's do it before any attacks uh, start start pointing out the problems. Um, so that's sort of, you know, some of the areas of focus on And again, uh, there, there's more information in the paper. Take one last look on the list of questions here. Um, and we'll get to a few before we have to close things out. Did we look at the number of SOC managers, CISOs that are providing the opportunity to play? Um, I don't think, Barb, I don't think we had that in here in the SOC surveys, we had some, um, no, I'm sorry, we didn't. It was all from the qualitative responses. So the answer to that, well, unless you know differently, Barbara, is no, we don't have that data. No, we didn't, unless there's something in some of the comments, but I don't think so. I think that would be a really good short poll, though. Yeah, type. that that's a good topic. That's a We'll take that as a suggestion to do some sort of poll. Um, last question we'll do, and then we'll close things out. When choosing between learning a new skill and getting a new certificate, what should a person interested in making a career move into security choose? What would change if you already have a cert? I'll let you take a first shot at that part. <laughs> well, I take a look at what I, how I got into this field to start with. I wasn't really doing security, but I was being tasked to do security. Um, and I looked around and said, you know, at that time, this is quite a few years ago, the GSEC seemed to be the best way to go because it gave me a learning experience. So I got my hands dirty doing stuff, learned the concepts and was still able to play a little bit. Um, but I think in terms of getting started, just there's a, you don't, I don't know if you necessarily, it depends on your motivation and it depends on how you learn. Um, if going through a formal course is the best way to get started, then do it that way. If the best way is to kind of do it on your own, do it that way. There's there's a lot of resources out there to do that. Um, and the same way, I think if you already have a certificate, um, see what you're interested in. You've probably already got your feet 
under you as far as the fundamentals go and just start looking to see where in the field you're the most interested because it's a very, very broad topic and a, very, a lot of places to go. Yeah, I guess what I would say is someone who's uh, um, sort of floated through security in, in strange ways. These days, I would definitely say learn that skill, learn how to use that tool, learn how to do something. And then uh, you'll get a job at a company who'll then pay you to take SANS courses and get a certificate. <laughs> I think that, you know, you look at software people, most software people are getting hired at the at the lower levels or right out of college, right out of high school. They have no certificates. They, they right. actually know how to program and, and wrote web apps and that's on their web resume, what they built, not what they, not a, some certificate stapled to it. So at that level, if you know, if you're at that level, have the skill first, learn how to do some stuff, play with the tools, participate in these uh, bug bounty type programs. You can uh, be a security researcher for and, and learn how to do stuff. And I think okay. also, if you're making the transition from IT, you've got a lot of opportunities also not to go, you know, pull people from IT to security. But if you have an IT background and you want to flow over to security, um, there's plenty of places to get started. One way not to impress the security side is to try to hack into the system from the IT side and then show the security side what you did. That will not get your job in security. That's okay. true. <laughs> we went through the Q&A, um, and I'm going to turn things over to Jessica for any final words now. All right. Thank you very much. So that's all the time that we do have for today. <clears throat> thank you to both of our speakers, John and Barbara, for your great presentation, and to Awake, Anomaly, Cisco, ExtraHop, Logarithm, Reversing Labs, Samplify, Swimlane, and Threat Connect. For sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. For our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.